The story begins with a hot kiss deeply affecting a woman named Pamela, and while her partner has his way with her, he reveals he's not from that world. Though curious, the woman is soon distracted by his ministrations, and as for the guy, he muses everything is just a game. After all, it's what an unknown voice told him before he found himself thrust into another world. The man's name is Naoto Kiritani, a level 5 hero, and hours earlier, he was dining with his level 24 friend and fellow traveler, Kenji Kinoshia. Like him, the other guy also got himself thrown into that world. Currently, Kenji expresses his gratitude to Frida, a person who he's thoroughly convinced saved their lives by providing them with food and shelter. The one is humble, saying she didn't do anything remarkable by helping them, but Naoto is suspicious, thinking she must want some kind of reward from them. When she asks if there's something on her face, he thinks he got caught staring, but she's actually referring to Kenji, who gets embarrassed and apologizes. Deciding to be frank, he asks her if she's after something, which flusters his friend, who then berates him for being rude to Frida. Inwardly, Naoto thinks Kenji is too trusting, especially since for them to return to their world, they have to defeat the Demon King, which is the goal of the game. Later, the blonde asks his comrade why he's so eager to trust every person they meet, but Kenji really believes that Frida is a nice person. Naoto tells him he's too trusting, before saying Kenji should be more careful and that he shouldn't get tricked if they're to defeat the Demon King. The other guy smiles, glad that the blonde is reliable and states everything will be okay if Naoto is in charge. However, the blonde is only level 5 with less than stellar stats compared to his friend, but he's able to see the status screens of other people. Naoto sighs, expressing this concern to Kenji, even though they beat the same mobs together. The other guy reminds him that it's his gift, before he gets instructed by the blonde not to tell anyone their gifts. As players in the game, they're both given gifts as weapons, and for Kenji, his gift is growth. He gains levels at a much higher order of magnitude than Naoto does, which is a gift that can easily make one the greatest. It makes Naoto worried because if people find out about Kenji's power, he's sure that there would be some individuals who are going to take advantage of his friend, but he's determined not to let that happen. To protect his friend, he'll have to learn more about how their new world works and how best he can use his gift. Later, he heads out to where the pubs are, finding the drunken crowd quite familiar. He purposefully goes into a back alley, wondering if this action would net him the same results it would back at his home. Predictably, some dangerous-looking people show up and one woman shows interest in the peculiar clothes that he's wearing. When a man brandishes a knife at Naoto, the blonde comments he made the right decision and he calmly observes the thug's status screens, quickly determining they're all at a slightly higher level than him. Thinking that they'd be a piece of cake for Kenji, he figures he can take them on as well. So when a level 9 man tries to attack him with the dagger, he grabs the man's jaw. Before the thug could injure the blonde, suddenly the former freezes before collapsing on the ground. His status screen showing that his levels are going down while Naoto's goes up. Immediately, the thugs are alarmed and one attacks, managing to injure Naoto's shoulder. The blonde retaliates by grabbing the man's face and suddenly, his shoulder heals. Naoto is pleased that he's getting more EXP and HP than he expected from them and like his fallen comrade, the thugs' levels go down. Naoto muses that this is his gift, the ability to steal someone's EXP and HP to then strengthen himself. After the last, thug runs away and Naoto addresses the level 8 Pamela, who's surprised that he knows her name. She begs him for mercy, so Mayoto then says he should get something in return from her. He leans in for a kiss, immediately overwhelming her with his touches, and after the act, Naoto muses that he's more than doubled his level after fighting the thugs. In addition to leveling up, the blonde is surprised to gain skills, wondering to himself out loud about it, before he gets questioned by Pamela on how he knew of her skills. Realizing that he got his skills from her, he figures there's more to his gift than just taking EXP and HP from his opponents, and depending on how he drains them, he can take their skills as well. After telling Pamela to behave, Naoto gets determined to use his gift's true power to clear the game. A week earlier, when Naoto was first thrust into that world, he was frustrated at what the voice had told him, they can only clear the game by defeating the Demon Lord, and after doing so, the winner may wish for anything even returning to the old world. However, there is only one Demon Lord, which is far less than the total number of people sent to that world. Reading his teeth, Naoto realizes the true battle is between them, the people sent to that world, and all the other players are his enemies. Cursing at his situation, he swears to himself that he'll survive and return to his home world, and he doesn't care who he needs to eliminate or betray to win. Suddenly, a group of vicious-looking beasts surrounds him, rendering Naoto helpless, as he doesn't even have a weapon to defend himself with. Out of nowhere, an even larger beast devours the group, terrifying the blonde. Just then, a rock is thrown at the gargantuan beast and somebody yells, attracting the beast's attention. It's a guy goading the monster to come at him, and Mayoto immediately realizes he's from his world, an enemy. The guy is successful in taking the beast's attention away from Naoto, and just when it's about to attack, the dark-haired teen evades. The monster crashes into a large rock and gets crushed by falling pieces of rubble from above. 
Both are saved and instantly, the stranger fusses over Naoto, asking if he's hurt. He then drags Naoto to safety, baffling the blonde as he can tell that the other guy is actually worried about him. Later, Naoto tells him that, according to the mechanics of the game, they're meant to be rivals, and he asks the stranger why he helped him. The guy replies there's no way he could just leave the blonde there, surprising Naoto as he's only ever encountered two kinds of people before, scums and idiots. As Kenji offers his hand to the blonde, Naoto muses it's his first time meeting a guy like him. And it's then that he has a new goal. He and Kenji will return to their world together. Currently, the two of them have become adventurers, defeating beasts together, and despite the two having a large level gap due to Kenji's gift, both work well together. At the moment, they've made the walled city of Jorn their base, and as they have signed up at the town's Adventurers Guild, they receive quests that involve jobs dealing with monsters. Later, when they return, they're greeted by Frida, who turned out to be an employee at the Adventurers Guild. Kenji informs her that they took care of their quest swiftly, and as the woman butters him with compliments, Naoto recalls how she's the one who recommended that they join the guild, guessing she must have gotten a promotion for scouting the two men. After the blonde observes his friend being all love-struck, Frida hands them their day's reward, which Naoto finds quite cheap considering they just defeated a bull lizard. As Frida is flustered, Kenji comes to her defense, saying it's how the guild works, but the blonde only complains about how they haven't ranked up in the guild yet. In the guild, both difficulty and the adventurer's rank determine the reward, and as they're new, they have to start from the bottom. As it's been a while, they should have been ranked up by the guild already, especially since Kenji is already level 50, far stronger than anyone in the city. With his gift and diligent personality, even if he's going about it regularly, the results are plain to see he's becoming strong as well as growing as a person. Meanwhile, on Naoto's end, as defeating trash mobs isn't doing much for his level, with the money he earns, he visits the brothels that employ former adventurers as workers. Through his gift, he acquires skills from them, and soon, he reaches level 25 with a vast plethora of skills to boot. After the deed, while thinking that he and Kenji need to rank up in the guild already, Naoto spots his friend with Frida, looking like they're currently on a date. After observing them, the blonde decides not to get in his friend's way, but he becomes stunned later when he hears the two only had dinner. Thinking that Kenji is too innocent, Naoto realizes that his friend likes Frida too much, and he becomes concerned about the woman's intentions, Wanting Kenji to be happy as well, the blonde decides to get to know Frida for his friend's sake. In the following days, whenever Kenji gets a request from Frida, he's always happy to do it, and as a result, he hasn't leveled up for some time now, as the monsters they fight don't give him enough experience anymore. Currently, Naoto confronts his friend about this, saying it's as if the brunette forgot their original goal, but Kenji insists he hasn't, saying he merely can't ignore the people being hurt by monsters, making the blonde silently curse the other guy's heroic personality. Inwardly, he agrees it feels good to fight for someone else's sake, but Frida's presence bothers Naoto. As they can't stay in that place forever, for Kenji and him to return to their homeworld together, the blonde needs to remove those that bind his friend to that place and those that take advantage of the brunette's kindness as well. Later that night, Naoto invites Frida to dinner, where both enjoy food and drinks. The blonde asks her if she's fine dining at such a coarse establishment, but the woman only responds that she's used to such places. When Naoto offers to bring her somewhere nicer for a change, she declines and the adventurer is reminded of how even though many people make a pass at the woman, she's known in the guild as the impenetrable Frida for a reason. However, when it comes to Kenji, Naoto notes how she only ever flirts with him. Finally, Frida asks Naoto if he has something to ask her, so he queries about how to defeat the demon king, which surprises the woman. He continues that if they take him down, then naturally, attacks on people by monsters are sure to settle down as well. The woman admits he isn't wrong, but she's doubtful that Naoto can pull it off as he's just a human and the Demon King is an immensely powerful being, to which the blonde inwardly agrees. When Naoto says Kenji can take down the Demon King considering the brunette's power, still, Frida refuses to be cooperative. After a bit of contemplation, the blonde decides to change his approach, backing off her case before urging her to drink. Grateful, she welcomes his change of subject, and they make small talk, while Naoto notices how she's gazing at him like trying to figure him out. Eventually, Frida passes out on her seat, totally drunk, which makes Naoto smirk, and he makes a show about how he has no choice but to carry her home. On their way to Frida's home, while the woman is still unconscious, the blonde reflects how once he learns a skill, it's as if it's engraved in his memory, like how wielding a knife now is easy for him. With the skills he pilfered, he's easily able to locate Frida's home and even mix a drug that he had added to the woman's drink earlier. Soon, Naoto has Frida on her bed, eliciting intimate sounds from her. As she's protesting half-heartedly, he tells her that she can push him away if she doesn't want his touch, but in the end, he has her yelling in ecstasy. Naoto muses that if he were born into that world, he's sure that he would have a mastery at giving women pleasure, considering that Frida hasn't walked away at all, when she could easily done so. 
Sounds of pleasure escape her mouth, which reinforces the blonde's belief that even without relying on magic or skills, he can make even prostitutes lose control. As he continues with his ministrations, Naoto asks Frida why she invited him and Kenji to the guild, and in between gasps, she answers it's only because they need strong people, but he doesn't believe her. The adventurer recalls how Kenji would do everything he can to clear the quests given to them, and indeed they've become a truly savior-like existence to the guild. Still, he has questions, and he demands to know how she knew from the start that they were strong, especially since at that time, they only looked like two young and ordinary men with no magic or weapons. She even knew about Kenji's gift, and then suddenly, even though she didn't answer, he now knows why. With his drained gift, he gained from her a rank of skill, appraisal sight, which allowed him to know everything about her with just a glance. He marvels at her skill, seeing the inspects of her other skills as well as her personal details. One particular piece of information catches his attention, so he then confronts Frida about the relationship she has with the guild master, which shocks the woman. Naoto reveals he knows about it because of the appraisal sight skill that he got from her and Frida becomes even more stunned that her skill can do something like that, which makes Naoto realize that the strength of the skill also depends on its user. Loudly, the blonde recalls that the guild master was someone in her 40s and he guesses it must be why Frida never gave in to the other male adventurer's advances. Naoto concludes that she must have banded together with the guild master to set him and Kenji up and keep them at bronze level, while using them without raising their wages. Frida, who's going crazy from the pleasure, begs Naoto to stop, but he only pressured her to tell him the truth. Overwhelmed, she admits that all of the blonde's accusations are true, and with Naoto's permission, she climaxes. Out of breath, Frida shakily asks Naoto who he is, and he concludes she probably didn't know he can make her feel that way as that ability wasn't listed in his arsenal of skills. After all, it was an ability born from the experiences he's built himself. He tells Frida that he can see everything about her, adding he knew when and where she secretly met with the guild master, as well as what they talked about. Frida is frightened not knowing the man is bluffing, and he continues to say that if their relationship is leaked, it would become a big mess, especially since the guild master is already married. Immediately, Frida begged him not to reveal the affair, and to her surprise, Naoto assures her he won't, saying he won't bring ruin to the people who helped them put food on their table. The blonde hints that he wants Frida to keep him happy and spare him and Kenji the cheap rewards, while he observes her wearing the expression he's seen many times in the past, one of fear at being at his mercy and the anticipation of being able to feel the pleasure she just experienced. He commands her to clean him up, and with her mouth, Frida eagerly complies. The next day, Kenji profusely thanks Frida, saying he suddenly got ranked up to platinum from bronze. He reveals that Naoto told him how she spoke on their behalf to the guild master, while she wears a conflicted expression on her face. When Kenji invites her to have dinner with him again, Frida accepts and thanks him before Naoto reminds his friend of his plan of getting a new weapon for their next quest. After Kenji bids them farewell, hurrying to the shop, Naoto addresses Frida, inviting her to an empty room while grabbing her behind. He silently apologizes to Kenji, since his friend likes her, but Frida is just a cunning woman who plans to take advantage of the brunette's kind heart. For them to take down the demon lord, Naoto is determined to take down all the nuisances that get in their way. After Naoto convinced Frida to rank him and Kenji up, their rewards, food, weapons, and armor improved significantly. Monsters cause disasters that shake cities and countries, but to Kenji, who has the gift of growth, they're merely experience points and in the blink of an eye, he has reached level 80. For that day's quest, they're to kill giant toads that can rot entire forests with their poison. Kenji stuns one, which Naoto praises him for, before he goes to touch the monster toad. Immediately, he's affected by the poison that coats the monster's entire body, but thankfully, his gift works fast enough, and soon he levels up. Naoto apologizes to Kenji for their current arrangement, but his friend only tells him not to worry about it, adding that he wants the blonde to hurry up and catch up to him. For Naoto to level up, Kenji weakens the monsters for him before the blonde uses his gift to take all the EXP. An arrangement the brunette assures him is common in online games. If Kenji ends up killing them, the experience points will be divided among the two, so they keep to this arrangement which Naoto finds a bit unpleasant. Currently, the blonde rejoices as he just reached level 50, but he's not done yet. After slicing through the toad's skin, Naoto slips his hand inside, getting himself injured with the monster's powerful poison before he acquires the S-rank skill, Poison Resistance. Kenji exclaims that Naoto's arm is back to normal, which the blonde is glad for, before saying he now understands how to use his gift, Drain. Before, he had thought it strange that he has to do the deed before he could absorb skills from others, but then, he realized that what he got from doing the act was contact with the inside of their bodies, their mucous membranes, so all he needs to do is get inside the body, and he was proven right. Naoto is excited as he can now steal skills from monsters that humans wouldn't ever learn, and he tells Kenji he'd like to drain another monster. The blonde is determined to gather as many skills as he can in the skill, 
appraisal site will be useful to him in this new endeavor. When Meoda tells Kenji to leave the cooking to him, the latter asks when the former learned the skill, but the blonde can't tell him the truth. Kenji doesn't know that he had used his gift while having intercourse, and Meoda knows the other guy won't react too well if he finds out. During dinner, Kenji is glad that they completed their mission without problems and that Meoto managed to gather a good number of skills. When he mentions that it's also great that they helped a lot of people by defeating those monsters, Meoto becomes silent, thinking they shouldn't worry about other people in a world that they'll eventually leave, but he knows Kenji genuinely cares. Upon suddenly hearing what the blonde describes as screams of a woman, the brumet immediately bolts, not listening when Meoto yells to wait for him. Nearby, two women are in trouble, you know, a swordswoman in area, a priestess. They're facing several orcs, and though Yuno tries to defend themselves, she's easily deflected by one of the monsters. Aria hovers protectively over her friend, but the salivating orcs merely rip her clothes off her. Suddenly, the monster's hand is severed before he gets sliced into two pieces. It's Kenji's work, and he puts himself between the girls and the orcs. Naoto asks the girls if they're okay, but they're more concerned about the presence of the monsters. The blonde assures them they're not a problem, and Kenji backs his words as he goes to deal with the orcs. Meanwhile, Naoto takes a closer look at the girls, noting how the priestess has a bigger chest than Frida, while the other girl is a demi-human. He inwardly thinks that both possess a beauty that would surpass any idol back in his world. Valiantly, Kenji faces the orcs alone, telling his companions to leave and take care of the injured girl. Aria immediately takes action, using her staff to conjure a top-tier light barrier, which surprises Naoto. He observes as the priestess tries to heal her friend, who's in a lot of pain, but despite her magic, the demi-human's recovery is very slow. The blonde tells Aria to let him take a look, and after using his appraisal sight, he quickly determines that her intestines are heavily damaged. Deciding to heal her himself, Naoto uses his skill, Cellular Repair, and just mere seconds later, a surprise Yuno doesn't feel pain anymore. Aria is stunned that Naoto's healing magic is stronger than hers, while the latter recalls how he stole the skill from a giant slime that has a ridiculous recovering ability. Soon, Kenji announces they're now safe, having defeated every orc, which makes the two girls tear up in gratitude. They express their thanks while Kenji tries to downplay his involvement, saying it's only normal to help each other in situations like earlier. Excitedly, the girls exchange glances, saying there's a favor they'd like to ask the two men. Later, back in the city of Jorn, Yuno reveals that originally they're going to make a request in the guild, as they wish to take her village back. Immediately, Kenji becomes concerned, asking what happened, while Naoto uses his appraisal sight on the two women, discovering they're able to resist his skill, as both have a fair amount of power. Yuno says that her village is being occupied by demons, the demon lord's subordinates, who impose themselves on the village, scattering away all the villagers. As Kenji doesn't know the difference between monsters and demons, Naoto explains that demons have intelligence and intellect similar to humans. They're high-level existences with the demon lord at the top, and compared to monsters, they're like nobles. When the blonde mentions that they're a race that eliminates humans without restraints, Kenji finally understands they're a bad bunch of guys. The adventurers ask why the demons attacked the village and Yuno haltingly answers because their village has been protecting the holy sword for generations, something that Naoto thinks is an Isekai-like item. Aria elaborates that the holy sword is the only thing capable of cutting the demon lord, so the latter, fearing its power, sent his subordinates to occupy their village. As Kenji finds it curious that the demons haven't off anyone or destroyed the sword, the girls explain that demons, even the demon lord himself, can't touch the holy sword, and that's why they can only secure and keep it on the place where it is. While Naoto muses about the chances of Kenji getting a hold of the great sword, his friend is already agreeing to help the women, making them grateful. Naoto sighs, knowing exactly what will happen if one asks Kenji for help, but he thinks the girl's request is a godsend, as the quests at Jorn's Adventurer's Guild weren't cutting it anymore for him and Kenji. Since demons are top-ranking monsters, fighting them is the best choice to level up, and if Kenji's strength is combined with the Holy Sword, then he'll only become even more powerful. Soon, their group is traveling to Yuno's village, having departed from Jorn before heading west. Currently, the demi-human is facing a monster, but when she's starting to have trouble dealing with it, Kenji is quick to her rescue and finishes off the beast. Immediately, Yuno is in awe, praising Kenji and calling him master, despite the brumet's protestations. She begs him to train her, to which Kenji agrees, saying he'll do his best. When Noono comments that Yuno isn't half bad, she suddenly turns away from him, leaving the blonde to scratch his head and think that she doesn't care about him at all. Turning back to his cooking, he gets approached by Aria, who makes small talk with him. Eventually, she glances at the other pair and comments that Yuno looks pretty lively, even though when she met her, she got a dead look in her eyes. Naoto responds that he's feeling pretty lively as well, as it's a change of pace from traveling alone with just another dude, making the priestess giggle. When Naoto asks Aria if she and Yuno came from the same village, she answers no, revealing she only met the girl by chance while the priestess was traveling as an adventurer. 
When she heard of Yuno's situation, she wanted to do something, but with her meager strength, she wasn't able to do anything. Yaoda falls silent, thinking that her story makes sense and how nothing about it is suspicious at all, but still he can't help but be doubtful, considering they can block his appraisal sight. As Kenji's strength is already cheeked here, by combining his strength and Mayoto's, they can already turn one or two countries upside down. However, just like Frida did, once people notice that power, they'll try to get a hold of it by any means. At the moment, Yuno is all over Kenji asking for tips and tricks about fighting, and when she discovers he hadn't been fighting for that long, the demi-human hails him as a genius. Naoto notes that their interactions are like that of siblings, but he can't help but think that Yuno is only acting. As he firmly believes that all women tell shameless lies, he can easily imagine a scenario where Yuno is actually a demon, using the so-called Holy Sword as bait to snare players. They're cheat abilities users, so it stands to reason that the demon lord will notice them as well, and as they don't know what kind of people are keeping an eye on them, Naoto is determined not to let anything slip. After all, he's someone who's used to being manipulated and manipulating others too, but Kenji isn't like that, and he won't forgive anyone who tries to deceive his pure-hearted friend. Whoever tries to deceive and make a profit out of him so shamelessly will have to face the blonde's anger. Kenji's the man who trusted someone as awful as Naoto, and he wants to clear the gang without exposing him to any malice. The blonde's eyes land on Yuno, who doesn't know she's already become his prey. Later that night, Naoto's skillful tongue is at work, and while Kenji and Aria are sleeping, Yuno is squirming under his touch, her body feeling hot. She tries to ease the urgency she's feeling, but it's no use, as Kenji had concocted a powerful aphrodisiac from the skill he pilfered from both humans and monsters. Once he had lured Yuno into her tent, the drug immediately kicked in, flooding both her mind and body with intense pleasure, while blocking the demi-human sense of pain and reason. While Yuno mules that her body feels strange, Naoto muses it wasn't his intention to rely on the use of an aphrodisiac, but he needs to confirm the demi-human's true agenda before arriving at their destination. Currently, the sword's win is feeling good, and she's becoming more and more insatiable that Naoto can't help but marvel at the drug he created. As she begs him for more, Yuno's resistance to his appraisal sight is weakening, and soon her stats are showing themselves to him. After a quick perusal of her personal details, Naoto is stunned to discover that she's been truthful all along and wasn't playing any tricks. Regretful, he apologizes to Yuno for having doubted her, but the demi-human doesn't hear him at all, too focused on the intense pleasure that's ravaging her body. Some time passes, but Naoto muses that she's not slowing down at all, even though the aphrodisiac's effects have long since worn off. The blonde tells her helplessly that they've already done it for the fifth time, but she doesn't hear him. As he's the one who gave her the drug, he decides that the least he can do is stay until she's fully satisfied, but he does wonder if they're going to keep doing it until morning rises. In the next few days, as Kenji had suggested, they help Yuno and Aria raise their levels while they head toward the Demi-Human's village. It would have been alright if Meoto and Kenji took care of the monsters themselves, but those two women kept insisting that they would follow them no matter what. Naoto now understands how Yuno feels, giving her all to save her home, while Aria, on the other hand, makes him wonder why the priestess would willingly follow her recently found friend on a life-threatening journey. As this world is just a game, its residents have their own feelings and consciousness, so everyone moves accordingly to their desires and Naoto wonders what exactly Aria's desires are. Later, Kenji gets some alone time by a river, sighing that he's really an idiot for taking detours, but he mutters he can't leave Aria and Yuno alone. Suddenly, Aria appears after hearing Kenji utter her name, much to the adventurer's surprise. Blushing, he tells her he was only thinking about some things, but the priestess points out that his face is red, becoming concerned that he might be sick. When the Brumit insists he's fine, Aria tells him not to hesitate in talking to her about anything. She wonders if they're causing him trouble, stating she knows how strong he is, but she also knows kindness has its limits. When she states she thought it was too much to ask him to fight demons on behalf of two complete strangers, Kenji assures her he doesn't think like that at all, revealing they're going to fight an even stronger enemy in the future, the Demon Lord. At Aria's stunned face, the brunette admits that their goal is pretty reckless, but Kenji is determined to defeat the Demon Lord as soon as they can, stating there's a reason for them to do it. Worriedly, Aria states they shouldn't have the time to help them, but the adventurer cuts her off, saying it's what he wants to do. Even if it's a detour and even without the Holy Sword, Kenji can't let what happened to Yuno and her village slide. Aria is moved by his words, blushing, and upon Kenji's admission that he's really an idiot, the priestess states she's the same as him. She became an adventurer to help people in need, but she isn't strong enough. She wants to help Yuno, but she's just useless. Kenji states he doesn't think Yuno thinks that way of her, assuring the priestess that her feelings have reached her friend and it has nothing to do with powers or level. As the two hold hands, unknown to them, Meono is eavesdropping through his skill, acoustic gathering. The blonde looks pensive, knowing that Kenji had helped him before out of his pure intentions, and it's the same with Aria. Suddenly, he flinches, his skill abruptly cancelled, 
before he looks down and tells Yuno to take it easy. Still, the demi-human continues taking him in with her mouth, and Mayato muses how she started to seek him every night. Finally, when they reach the edge of Yuno's hometown, they discover a magic barrier surrounding the village, but Naoto thinks it serves more as a warning to others to stay away if they want to live. Using his skill, Farsight, the blonde sees mean-looking demons, and he mentions this to the others, which sparks Yuno's anger. Suddenly, he sees something alarming before Yuno asks him if he can see the villagers. The blonde reveals he can't see any humans in the village, alarming Kenji. What Mayoto sees are just demons and skeletal remains of humans, and on top of a pile of bones, the blonde spots sneakers, which for sure came from a player. In that world, even the players only have one life, so they all need to be careful. With a grin, Naoto announces to his group that they're going to need a plan. While the demons are dining, they suddenly hear a loud noise in the distance, and immediately, they all move to deal with the potential threat. When the monster finds the cause of all the loud noise, it turns out to be Naoto who's using his skill, Shout. Quickly, he defeats a demon, slashing at the creature with his clawed hand. He goads them into attacking him, and when they comply, the demons fall into his trap, unable to move. Naoto reveals he used his skill, paralyzing poison breath, and spread it all around the area. The demons might be a threat to Yuno and area, but to Naoto, they're just easy prey with experience and skills he can steal from. He'll stab into their bodies with his hardened claws and use his drained gift. Just then, a demon begs for mercy, surprising the blonde that they can speak their language. He then questions the demon if he had shown mercy to the people in that village, and without waiting for an answer, the adventurer tells the demon to suffer and die, before his hand goes through the monster's body. Meanwhile, Kenji tells the girls that Naoto's diversion worked, and while he goes to look for the Holy Sword, he instructs them to search for any survivors and rescue them. The girls agree, and after they tell him to take care of himself, they separate ways. Later, Kenji enters the temple, the place that Yuno said where the sword is, and inside, he is greeted with a pile of corpses, injuring the brunette that so many lives were lost. Suddenly, a demon appears from behind him, stating that humans are truly stubborn creatures. Her name is Foderlins, a level 100 demon, and as Naoto glares at her, she notes that he looks different from the other humans she's encountered. The demon states that his scent reminds her a lot of the woman who came before him, pointing at a ruined parka and sneakers. Kenji looks horrified, realizing that the demon was probably referring to a player, a person who came from the same world as him and Naoto. He figures that the player must have tried to get a hold of the holy sword that could defeat the demon lord before anyone else can. However, unlike him, who has the growth gift, a normal player would have no chance of taking on a level 100 photo lens. Currently, the demon admits that the player had unusual powers, but as there's no way a human could rival her magical power, Foderlins made a good example out of the player for the other humans who will dare confront her. She reveals the player was assaulted and tame as nothing more than a meat toilet, and when she was told that they'll keep her alive if she accepted her fate, she yielded with a smile on her face. When the time arrived for her to be dispatched, she cried and wailed, saying it was not what they promised her. Foderlins laughs as she recalls how the player begged for mercy, saying the human gave them good entertainment. Coldly, Kenji tells her to be silent, and the demon becomes surprised when the brunette starts to gather power around him. Kenji tells Foderlins that he doesn't consider her human, offending the demon, before saying that he will eliminate her without remorse. Foderlins starts the battle by gathering a big ball of power in her hand before sending it toward Kenji, aiming to turn him into cinders. The adventurer notes that her attack is fast. But it's nothing compared to a fastball at the batting center, sending her attack back. Immediately, he rushes toward her, surprising the demon with his speed. With a yell, he brings his sword down toward her, but in the last second, Foderlins manages to conjure a magic barrier to protect her. She calls him insolent, but Kenji states it's her who's insolent between the two of them. The adventurer cracks her magic barrier, shocking the demon as this skill has been passed down to her by the demon lord, and eventually, he breaks through her defenses. Outside, Naoto is almost done dealing with his share of demons, and after using his drained gift again and again, he thinks he's starting to have duplicates of the skills he's already absorbed. Suddenly, the blonde senses that someone is going to attack him from behind, and thankfully, he was able to dodge in time. With a mighty wave of his large axe, the demon manages to blow away Naoto's poisoned breath, the creature thundering about how the human dared to poison his comrades. More demons arrive, putting the blonde in a pickle, when suddenly, a magic circle appears beneath the demon's feet before tendrils of magic bind them, restricting their movements. Someone jumps over Nato. It's Yuno, who then casts her skill, Whirl and Flame, at the demons, causing them to burn. Aria approaches the adventurer, offering to heal him, but he refuses, his attention caught by the magic circle that appeared earlier and the strange words she uttered. When he questions if that was Aria's skill, she confirms it was, so Naoto then thanks her for saving him. The three of them team up to fight the rest of the demons, while inside the temple, Foderlins is on the ground, unable to believe that she lost to a mere human. She was asked by the demon lord to guard the holy sword, and out of the other four heavenly kings, she was entrusted with that important task, yet she failed. 
When the demon asks who the adventurer is, Kenji replies he's just a human who can't forgive misdeeds, pointing a sword at her threateningly. Just then, Naoto and the girls arrive to Kenji's pleasant surprise, and they reveal that they've already dealt with all of the demons outside, which confirms there weren't any survivors at all. As Kenji looks sad, Yuno tells him that the number of bones doesn't match the village's population, so she's positive that though there are people who died, many still manage to escape. She's just glad that they were able to take her village back, and she thanks the two men profusely for their help. After Kenji expresses his hope of Yuno meeting with the other survivors soon, Naoto teases him for acting cool when the brunette is actually hesitating on killing the demon woman, which his friend doesn't deny. Kenji confesses that even though he knows that Foderlins is a demon, her appearance makes him hesitate, so Naoto then offers to let him deal with her. The blonde instructs Kenji to find the holy sword with the others, and after they leave, Foderlin speaks up, saying that no matter how much he'll make her suffer, she will never yield to a mere human. Naoto grins evilly at her, finding her words interesting, before thinking that there are a lot of things he wants to do to her. The only sword that can defeat the demon lord suddenly appeared one day and has since been enshrined in that village for hundreds of years. Every day, adventurers visit the village to test their luck in pulling out the sword, but in the end, no one was able to do it. The only person capable of accomplishing this feat is none other than the legendary hero, who will defeat the demon lord. Currently, Kenji and Area finally find the holy sword, and the priestess asks if the adventurer's goal is truly to defeat the demon lord, which Kenji confirms. She informs him that whoever pulls the sword out is destined to do just that, but if he's not able to do it, Aria queries what he plans to do. Kenji answers he'll have to think of another way, as he has to defeat the demon lord no matter what, and additionally, he's sure that Naoto will help him come up with something. Though Aria still looks worried, Kenji muses that he doesn't need to rely on the holy sword to accomplish his mission, because he still has his gifts, and he could always level up and get stronger. Even if he has to defeat the demon lord barehanded, he'll still do it, even though he thinks it will be quite impossible. Deciding not to worry about anything at the moment, Kenji grabs the sword's hilt and swiftly pulls it out. The brunette is bewildered at how easily he's done it, and even Aria is stunned as well. Just then, a voice congratulates Kenji inside his head for obtaining the holy sword, and he wonders if the sword is one of those aid items that the developer put in the game. At his unsure expression, Aria asks her companion if he's not happy about the outcome, but Kenji assures her he is, and he now has a higher chance of taking down the demon lord because of it. As she's also wearing a sad expression, Kenji asks her what's wrong when she suddenly asks him to take her with him on his journey to defeat the demon lord. The adventurer is confused, pointing out that Yuno's village is now safe, so there's no need for her to risk her life with them. Since they also will be facing enemies along the way, Kenji states he's not sure he can always be there to protect her. Even so, the priestess claims that she wants to go with him and help him because it was Kenji who gave her courage when she was weak. It was him who was always protecting her and Yuno, making her feel touched and happy that he was worried about them. And currently, she thinks she now has enough strength not to get in his way. When the priestess states she can't bear to think that he might die on his journey, Kenji realizes that Aria is scolding him in her own way. He was trying to save Yuno's village even though his goal was to defeat the demon lord, and he was indeed being reckless and taking unnecessary risks. Just like Naoto, Aria was just worried about him all along, and currently, she's holding his hand earnestly. In another part of the temple, screams can be heard, begging to be forgiven. They're from Foderlins, who's currently being overwhelmed with pleasure by Naoto, and the man notes that doing women from the demon race isn't bad at all. While she tries to protest, Yuno, on the other hand, requests that the blonde give her attention next. With his drain gift, Naoto earns new but hard-to-pronounce skills from the demon, and immediately he uses Foderlin's enslavement spell on her. After she screams as her pride and beliefs are being stripped away from her, Naoto tells her that from now on she will obey his every command. Though the skill only works against low-level opponents, Naoto is successful in casting it as he has already taken quite a few levels from the demon. When he asks her how she's feeling, she admits that she feels good and the blonde promises that he's going to break her from the inside out, so when he calls, he expects her to come running to him. He tells her not to worry because after they eliminate the demon lord, he'll set her free, though she has to promise not to cause any more trouble. Foderlins asks him how he's making her feel so good, wondering if it's a skill he has, and Naoto answers he's just big with lots of experience. After she climaxes, Yuno begs him to make her feel good as well, while the blonde complains about how his new skills are hard to read. When Foderlins reveals that all demonic skills are like that, Naoto freezes, looking alarmed at the sudden realization that he just had. Afterward, when people hear that Kenji was able to pull out the holy sword, they were met with much excitement from normal citizens, who declare he must be the legendary hero, especially since he and his party defeated the demons that were occupying the village in such a short amount of time. Later, when Naoto mentions that all they need to do now is to defeat the demon lord, there's an unsure expression on his friend's face, even though he agrees with the blonde's statement. 
Nelano asks Kenji if he's getting cold feet, but the latter denies it, saying that once they defeat the Demon Lord, they'll get their wish granted, which the blonde confirms. The brunette wonders if that wish isn't only limited to them going back to their original world, which surprises Naoto, who then asks his friend what's up with him. Flustered, Kenji tells the blonde to forget everything he said, but Naoto already knows the answer. When he asks Kenji if he's already starting to get attached to that world, the brunette doesn't deny it, saying they've been under other people's care after all. Naoto gets what his friend is trying to say, as it's a world where you can do whatever you want with the cheat skills that you have, and honestly, the blonde too would be a little sad to see it all end, but there's no point in becoming a billionaire if you don't come back to the world where you came from. In that world, there are no cars, no internet, no technology, and just no real reason to stay in it for them, but Naoto can easily see through his friend. When he guesses that it must be Aria who's holding Kenji back, the brunette blushes, making the blonde sigh in exasperation. Naoto asks his friend what's good about her, and the latter honestly replies that she's pretty, making the blonde ask if Kenji is the type of guy who would choose a girl by her looks. When the brunette also points out that the priestess cares for him as well, Naoto doesn't quite believe him. Kenji adds that Aria is the second person in that world to care about him, as the number one had always been Naoto. The blonde reflects that no one would think of caring about Kenji if they knew he is this strong, but he knows the guy. Naoto knows his friend has a high level of honesty, but he's got this dumb side of him that's borderline dangerous. The blonde doesn't care what happens to scumbags like him, but he wants to somehow send Kenji back to the world they came from, so he can't let this game screw his friend over. Observing their female companions from a distance, Naoto teases Kenji by saying that Aria must have realized how stupid his friend is, much to his friend's indignation. When the blonde concludes that the brunette has found a woman who sees him for who he is other than his level, Kenji agrees with his statement. Naoto understands his friend's feelings, but he doesn't agree with them, as after all, this world is nothing more than a game. It's a war zone where other players try to outsmart each other, and one day there will be people who will try to eliminate Kenji and take advantage of him. Aria is no exception, and Naoto tries to convince his friend to give up on her, saying she's just trying to seduce Kenji. Bewildered, the brunette asks the blonde if he has any proof of this claim, but Naoto can't be honest about what happened with Frida. He tries to be vague about it, saying he once had an affair with a woman who looked like her, but Kenji isn't convinced. That night, Naoto enters Aria's room at the inn, and the latter questions why he visited her when it's already so late. Deciding to be direct, he states he has a question for her, before asking why the priestess decided to tag along on their journey. Aria answers she wants to be of help to Kenji as she couldn't accept the thought of losing him in a tragic situation, assuring Naoto that she's aware of the risks. The Drain user insists it's not what she really wants, convinced that she's doing it for self-satisfaction, which Aria doesn't deny, saying it's what they all do. Naoto states he doesn't care if it's for self-satisfaction or world peace that she's doing all this, reflecting that Kenji, the Good Samaritan, is doing the same, and they're all just fighting for their own satisfaction in the end. However, it's not what Naoto wants to say, revealing he's just trying to figure out the true reason why Aria is interested in joining them. He asks her if someone is ordering her to keep an eye on their actions, which only baffles Aria, who then asks Naoto about who he's alluding to. Without hesitation, he answers it's the Demon Lord, rendering the priestess' face expressionless. Smiling awkwardly, Aria asks Naoto what he's talking about, but the latter straight up tells the priestess that she's just another lackey of the Demon Lord. Initially, Aria denies his accusation, insisting that she's human, but the Drain user calls her out for lying. When the priestess asks if he has any proof of his claim, Naoto answers that Aria's skills are written and said in a weird language, stating that Foderlins told him that those are skills that none but demons could use. Immediately, Aria raises her staff, looking scared and alarmed, but she restrains herself and eventually lets her staff go. Defeated, she admits that Naoto's accusations are true, so the latter then questions her why she approached him and Kenji in the first place. The now-revealed demon answers is to watch the hero's movements and instantly, Naoto takes note of how she's calling Kenji a hero, a title that demons use for them. When he questions Aria if she had known already who they were when she met them, she answers she didn't know the details, but she was told that Naoto and Kenji are a threat to all demon lords in the world, so she was sent to watch them and observe what kind of people they are. Naoto states that she was successful in finding Kenji, and the priestess admits that she planned to find him by looking for strong humans. The male adventurer muses that Aria is just like Frida, only in a different setting. Now that he understands the situation, Naoto tells the demon to go back to the demon lord. He's finding the whole situation convenient as he can get rid of the woman who tricked Kenji, eliminating the brunette's reason to stay in that world. They're free to go back to their own world after defeating the demon lord without any worries. Coldly, Naoto tells Aria that if she leaves now, he'll let her walk away, and he wants her to never show her face in front of him or Kenji again. The demon is silent, which makes the Drain user ask what's gotten into her. Timidly, Aria asks Naoto not to reveal what they've talked about to Kenji, 
adding that if he learns the truth about her being a demon, she's sure that it will make him sad. When Naldo states that she's right about how the brunette will react, Aria earnestly begs the other adventurer to bring her along on the journey as she doesn't have anywhere else to go. Nemono is stunned in disbelief that she would ask for something like that when he had already caught her red-handed for being a spy. When Aria mentions her level when they first met, the Drain user is reminded that she was only around level 20. An ordinary adventurer could have easily defeated her then, before recalling the demons that occupy Yuno's village are all at least level 50. When Naona concludes that Aria must be one of those lowly demons, the priestess doesn't deny it, saying even if she finds the hero, there's no way she can defeat Naoto or Kenji. The blonde asks her why she couldn't just run away and report to the demon lord, as at her current level, she'll be now able to move up the ladder. However, when she remains silent, her face red, Naoto realizes that she must have fallen for Kenji. Aria blushes even more, and the drain user can't fathom how it all happened. The priestess reveals that she doesn't want her creator, the demon lord, or Kenji, who taught her how to live a straight life to die. Because Naoto is still stuck on the fact that she's fallen for his friend, Aria explains that Kenji is a good person, and the blonde can't believe that the brunette's stupidly honest personality has made even the enemy fall for him. With tears in her eyes, the demon begs Naoto to let her see Kenji's fight to the end, promising to do anything in exchange. The male adventurer muses that he doesn't care anymore if Aria is telling the truth or not, as he's already made up his mind that this woman is a dangerous existence for Kenji. If his friend is to stay in that world, he will surely be killed someday, and as long as the demon is around, Kenji will want to stay. It's already clear to him that he needs to get rid of any liability for his friend, so he grabs Aria's chest, stating that his silence has a price. The priestess recoils from his touch, saying she didn't know he was that kind of person. With an evil smile, Nather states that he's always been a scumbag, and if she doesn't want to pay the price, he'll tell everything to Kenji. Aria flinches as the man continues to say that her betrayal will likely tear the brunette apart, and Kenji might lose focus and end up getting killed by the demon lord. With his words, Naona is sure that Aria's concern for her beloved will force her to make a choice. He goads her into taking her clothes off, promising to make her feel good. After hesitating, Aria strips in front of Naoto, who muses that he doesn't care about getting his hands dirty, as he's only determined to bring Kenji back to their world. Now fully naked, Aria the hindrance in Naoto's way, calls him a scumbag. Naoto grins evilly at the demon before grabbing her shoulders and kissing her passionately. He busies himself with tasting her, and he massages her chest. While noting that she's been resisting so far, Aria protests against his ministrations, but ultimately, she's helpless. Naoto is determined to train her thoroughly until she begins to seek pleasure on her own. He continues to overwhelm the demon with pleasure until she starts to loosen, but he's not done yet. He goes down on her, making her body arc in pleasure, and she pleads with him to stop, stating she's going crazy. What Naono is doing to her makes Aria cover her eyes, and the man states that if she doesn't want to look, she'll have to turn around. With her bottom sticking up in the air, Naoto proceeds to violate the demon, and while doing the act, the blonde man starts to feel a certain sensation, like what he felt when he did it with Foderlins. He figures it must be the difference between doing it with humans and demons, and Naoto finds it absolutely amazing. As they continue to do the deed, the drain user's control threatens to slip and he deems the demon as a total piece of work. Not just her insides, but her voice, her reactions, and just her total body. It's as if she was made to give pleasure to her partner. When Naoto is about to climax, Aria begs him not to do it inside, but he doesn't listen. The demon is thoroughly spent, however, the blonde man isn't satisfied yet. He announces he wants another round before having her under his mercy again, and he muses it seems that he can't get enough of her. All the while, he's pilfering new skills from her, and silently, he apologizes to Kenji, thinking he'll be keeping Aria to himself, as after all, he's doing it for his friend. Now that they have the Holy Sword in their hands, demons will no longer be a problem, and the only thing left to do is for them to put an end to the Demon Lord, before they book out of that world. After having just defeated a gargantuan demon, they determine, after looking at a map, that the Demon Lord's lair is 600 kilometers northwest of Jorn, and it's an area full of monsters that are far stronger than the others they've encountered, so there's no place to stay. While Yuno observes that the road is very steep, Kenji guesses it would probably take half a month to get to the lair by carriage. Naoto muses that, as apparently one can't fly long distances or warp, it's an aspect of the game that the god or devil of that world designed, intending it to be a fair competition for the players. Knowing that their journey will be slow, the party spends about a week preparing for the trip. They level up, check the best routes, purchase the best equipment, stock up on the necessary tools they would need, and buy food, water, and a variety of medicines. Currently, Kenji is surprised at the number of stuff Naoto is buying, but the latter assures him that they're just the essentials. Thanks to the skills he stole from Foderlins and the others, his alchemy skill leveled up to S rank, so now he can synthesize whole items. Later, Naoto hands Frida a box saying it's a present for her. 
Initially, she's confused, but when he instructs her to touch it, she recognizes it as something just like Naoto's, based on the texture and temperature. The adventurer states it's so that Frida won't feel alone while he's away, which makes the woman sad that he's actually going to leave. The blonde man thinks whether they defeat the demon lord or not, they'll have to say goodbye to everything in that world anyway, so they should settle all their previous relationships. When Naoto asks Frida for a high-performance carriage, she promises to prepare it for them, but in exchange, she has a request. She wants him to hold her every day until the day Naoto and his party leave. The woman confesses that she misses him, and so that night, the two meet up privately to have fun with each other's bodies. Naoto muses that Frida was supposed to do whatever he wanted, but it seems that it ended up that it was her who did as she pleased. With her carriage prepared, the now high-leveled Kenji and Naoto, along with the now stronger Yuno and Aria, are ready to embark on their journey toward the Demon Lord's castle. If their levels are any less than what they have right now, Naoto muses it would have been a death trip, but since that wasn't the case, the monsters that appear before them are just right for gaining experience. After taking their skills and cooking their meat, they dine on the monsters they've defeated. When Kenji asks Naoto where the girls are, the latter answers that Aria is treating Yuno, so there's nothing to worry about. The Bruin appreciates that they've adapted well to eating survival food, making the blonde declare that it's all thanks to his cooking and anti-poison skills that they can eat what they're having and not die. With a big smile, Kenji thanks his friend for all his efforts before asking Naoto how far they are from the Demon Lord's castle. When the blonde answers that they're already a third of the way there, Kenji looks serious before revealing that he's already made up his mind to confess to Aria. While Naoto is looking alarmed, Kenji continues to say that whether they get back to their world or stay in their current one, he'd still like to hear her answer after his confession. He acknowledges that Naoto might not be oak with it, but he wants to know how she feels about him, which makes the blonde sigh, saying he doesn't care anymore. While Kenji sets off to look for Aria, Foderlins follows him with a mischievous look on her face. During his search for Aria, Kenji reflects that he understands why Naoto was trying to stop him, as after all, the world they're in is a game. Trying to stay in such a world is like getting addicted to internet games as their reality is elsewhere, but Kenji doesn't really care about how much of their current world is a dream or not. He can feel it in his heart and his feelings for Aria are real, so when he finally reaches her, he asks, once their journey is over, if Aria could stay by his side for the rest of his life. The priestess' initial expression of happiness changes, and she turns her face away from the swordsman, trembling as she apologizes to him. While Kenji is crushed, Aria reveals that she cares about him very much, but she needs some time to think. However, she assures him that it's not that she hates him, but rather that he's really precious to her, so she wants the adventurer to give her some time. Because of what she said, though Kenji is sad, it gives him hope as Aria did confess that he's precious to her. Determined, the brunette promises himself that he'll tell the priestess again of his feelings when they finally defeat the demon lord, and for that to happen, he'll have to get stronger in order not to fail. Suddenly, Aria flinches and she covers her mouth while she trembles, making Kenji concerned. She assures him there's nothing to worry about while in the distance, Foderlins observes them. With her demonic powers, she's able to give Naoto live feedback on what's happening and the blonde is a bit surprised that his friend actually went and confessed, but he knows that Aria has no option but to reject him. He doesn't need to step in, as after all, she's a pawn of the demon lord, so there's no way she can say yes. In fact, Naoto believes that asking Kenji to let her think about it until the demon lord is defeated is a cruel decision in a way. Later, the blonde adventurer has the demon on the other side of a ruined brick wall, all hot and bothered, and he questions whether she's oak with them dispatching her master, to which she answers no, when he reaches from within her. Naoto is satisfied to discover that she has followed his instructions of leaving the tool he had created inside her the whole day. When he pulls it from her, it's revealed it's the same kind of toy he had given Frida. Cruelly, Naoto asks her how it felt being confessed to by Kenji while the toy is inside her. When she doesn't speak immediately, the blonde pressures Aria to answer, but all she replies is that Kenji isn't the same type of guy as Naoto, who agrees saying the brunette is a total greenie when it comes to these kinds of things. Aria tells him not to badmouth Kenji, but he only tells her to shut up, threatening her with the possibility that the brunette will wake up. He kisses her before having his way with her, and soon, Aria loses herself to the pleasure that Naoto has to remind her to keep it down again, or else the others will wake up. Desperately, she covers her mouth, struggling to be silent, but she still lets out some noises, which Naoto comments on. He continues to scare her that her noises will wake Kenji up, but he knows that once the other guy sleeps, he won't wake up at all, especially since they had a rough day. As for Yuno, the blonde knows she's awake and listening as beast folk have really good ears and he suspects she must be affected by what he and Aria have been doing. When Nada wonders what Kenji's face will be like if he ever finds out what they're doing, the demon begs not to let that ever happen. The Drain user comments that seeing Aria in her usual attire is making him crazy as it feels like she's doing cosplay, and though she doesn't understand, Naoto is determined to make the girls dress up next time. After all, he has money, but he just doesn't know if he's going to make it back alive. 
Again, when they climax, Arya begs Naoto not to do it inside, but again, he doesn't listen. The blonde man is satisfied while the demon tears up. He reminds her that she also enjoyed what they just did, and the man silently muses that although Arya's body is honest, she still retains the same stubborn attitude. Naoto wonders if she'll break before they get to the demon lord's castle, before telling himself that he'll make sure she completely does. As expected, the area around the demon lord's castle is full of strong enemies of over 100 levels, and there are many of them, determined not to let the adventurers advance easily. However, their strategies have grown more advanced than before, and currently, the two women are no longer thought to be a hindrance. Area's support magic has improved, while Yuno has been taking down a lot of enemies using her speed and melee attacks. Meanwhile, Naoto seals the enemy's movements for Kenji, who will then deal the final blow. As they now have unmatched coordination, Naoto figures they have enough power, so all that's left is to head toward the Demon Lord's castle. Of course, the blonde is not one to neglect night training either, and that night he's entertaining Yuno, who's confessing that she likes Naoto. When he asks about what she feels about Kenji, the demi-human answers that he's her master and she respects him, but it's with Naoto that she likes doing this kind of stuff with. Smudly, he addresses Kenji's sleeping form, saying this is what Yuno truly feels. He tells her that no matter how hard she screams, the other male adventurer won't wake up as he had to use one of his skills because the cave is too small. After Naoto satisfies Yuno, her body thoroughly spent, he comments that they'll finally reach the castle and from a distance, he observes that it looks big. He turns to his side, asking Ariad if she's getting nostalgic about going home, but she looks absorbed in the pleasure she's feeling. After he informs her that he's free, the blonde man asks the demon what she's going to do. For Yumino's sake, as well as to save pitiful people, Arya threw herself into a dangerous journey. In Kenji's eyes, she's like an angel or a goddess. A totally innocent woman, but what the brunette doesn't know is he's being deceived by this. After an invitation from Naoto, even though she's initially hesitant, she still strips her clothes before impaling herself on him. The blonde man muses that after peeling off Arya's outer mask of what appears to be a saint, all that's exposed is a lewd woman who craves for pleasure. When he points out her eagerness, the demon makes an excuse that he told her to do it, but he reminds her that he didn't give her instructions earlier. She's saying that he pressured her to stay silent, but Naoto knows that no matter how much she tries to reject what she's doing, it's only an obvious facade. Her body can't lie to him anymore. Soon, Arya loses her rationality and her pursuit of feeling good, all the while screaming in ecstasy. Even though tomorrow is finally the day of their decisive battle with the demon lord, the two women keep Naoto up throughout the night. And if the blonde doesn't have his self-healing skills, he would have been in trouble. The next day, Kenji and his party finally enter the demon lord's castle, and upon emerging out from a long tunnel, they're greeted by a city of demons, its citizens, peaceful like that of its human counterpart. As the party looks around, bewildered, some citizens spot them, and immediately, they run away in fright, screaming in fear at their presence. Nevano asks Arya what's going on, and she tells him that what they're seeing is indeed the country that is ruled over by the demon lord. The blonde male realizes that even for the demon race, it's not like they're always invading and committing evil crimes, and so that means that those demons also have their own social life and way of living. Currently, the guards are even trembling as they attempt to do their jobs, declaring the town won't let them through. When Naoto asks Kenji what he wants to do, the latter questions if perhaps there are demons that haven't committed any sins. As the blonde states what he's saying is possible, Kenji decides that they'll only be taking down the demon lord, planning to head straight toward where their opponent is. Naoto answers he knew his friend would want that, so he then addresses the guards, asking where their leader is. When the blonde spots a tall, rectangular building in the distance, he knows is probably where the demon lord resides. Without wasting another second, Naoto grabs the girls and using his skill, they rush through the guards, with Kenji matching his speed. Finally, they reach the rectangular building, wondering if it really is the demon lord's castle. The Naoto is saying that it seems to be the case for the town, he's getting a hunch that it's all fake, as it all feels too good to be true. Kenji agrees, commenting that the castle looks fabricated, like it's something out of a game. After the blonde responds that it's a fitting landmark for their final goal, Kenji and the rest of the party finally enters the building. Once inside, they're surprised that the whole place is bare and right in front of them is one lone figure. The hooded individual acknowledges their arrival, addressing them as heroes before offering to call them players. The two male adventurers are unsure, wondering if the shabby old geezer is the demon lord. So Kenji directly asks if he's the one they're looking for, as he admits he can't see the old man's status at all. Now, though, silently agrees, noting how the hooded man has everything hidden away. Finally, the unknown person admits that he's a special existence, created by what this world's inhabitants refer to as a god, or for the players, a demon. The hooded individual admits that he was designed as the game's last destination, the final obstacle, or in terms that should be familiar to the players, the last boss. 
While Naoto is wondering if the Demon Lord is aware that his entire existence was configured for a game, the hooded individual reveals that demons and monsters are born as something like pawns that are used to thwart the players. However, just because they're a pawn, it doesn't mean they're meant to perish, and for decades, they prayed for prosperity and increased their numbers, but still the land where they lived in peace kept on being snatched away from them. The Demon Lord says that all they ever wanted is peace and prosperity, so he doesn't intend on cutting corners, especially since it's been about a couple thousand years that he lived in that world. Immediately, an intensely powerful aura emanates from the hooded figure, threatening to overwhelm everyone in the party. Kenji valiantly tells his friends to get down, while the Demon Lord states that demons also have their own attachment toward life, so even if he's nothing more than a pawn in God's game, he believes he has the right to live. Kenji responds that they too also have a reason to fight before rushing to attack the old man, but he's thwarted by a magical barrier that the hooded figure conjured. The brunette is relentless with his attacks, but he's repelled every time. Kenji wonders why the holy sword isn't working, when it's supposed to be the weapon that could destroy the demon lord, and the hooded figure admits that what Kenji said is right, so it's why he came up with a preventive technique to work against it. For the past few thousand years, he's come up with a protective barrier that can negate any attacks that come from humans, stunning both Kenji and Meodo. With this barrier, the Demon Lord is confident that he'll be able to defeat them and all the other heroes will come and aim to take his life. Trembling, Kenji spirals into despair, mind racing on what he should do to win, but Naoto manages to calm him down. The blonde tells him not to think too much and just try rushing forward like he always did, because if human attacks don't work, Naoto will help him. Immediately, Naoto uses his skills to get closer to the Demon Lord, musing that even if his attacks won't work, if he just buffs himself, the hooded figure won't be able to deal with him. Suddenly, the old man states he knows exactly where the blonde is, quickly hitting Naoto with an attack. However, the figure turns out to be just an afterimage, and right behind the demon lord, Naoto summons Foderlins to bind her master. After the female demon sincerely apologizes to her creator, the demon lord says the attack is useless, easily breaking through the restraints. Just then, Naoto appears beneath the old man, declaring he finally has him at a perfect time. Immediately, the blonde pierces the hooded figure with a demon attack, taking the latter by surprise, and while the demon lord is distracted, Naoto tells Kenji to strike now. The brunette doesn't waste time, but still, the old man is able to conjure magic, intending to hit Kenji with it. However, Yuno intervenes, hitting the demon lord's arm, causing the attack to barely hit Kenji. When the swordsman is right above the hooded figure, with a yell, he throws the holy sword, shocking the enemy. The attack works, the demon lord is pierced, and Naoto states they found a lufal. The barrier isn't effective if the holy sword isn't wielded by a human hand. The demon lord collapses to the ground, and while both adventurers are wondering if they finally defeated him, a voice in their head congratulates them both. The voice praises them, saying they did a splendid job of crushing the demon lord, and as for the reward, both Kenji and Meoto will be presented with wish tickets. At the moment, the demon lord still manages to speak, understanding the ingenuity of their plan. After the human threw the sword, it just became a sword whose holy power was able to pierce him. He even praises Yuno for her successful attempt at distracting him, before he then turns toward Naoto, asking who the hell he is. Recalling that the blonde attacked him with the demon race's magic, the old man asks Naoto if he's not human, to which the drain user responds that he is. As the demon lord is confused, a crying area steps forward, causing the hooded figure to ask if her skills have been taken away by a human. His daughter doesn't answer, and finally, the demon lord understands what happened between her and Naoto. Suddenly, Kenji places his hand on Arya's shoulder, telling the dying demon that both he and Arya have chosen a road where they'll create their future together. It doesn't matter if she's his daughter or if she's a demon, Kenji is determined to create a peaceful world with Arya. The demon lord looks stunned and tries to say something, but before he could, his body deteriorates into ash, leaving only his cloak to fall on the ground. While Arya grieves, Naoto muses that the wish tickets they've acquired can grant them their wish anywhere and anytime, and it's an item that can only be used by those who received it. The blonde tells his friend that before they say their goodbyes to that world, they should take care of their unfinished businesses. Kenji has his eyes on Aria, looking at her pensively. Later, back at Jorn, everyone celebrates and congratulates the heroes for successfully subjugating the demon lord, and Kenji finds himself swarmed by the grateful citizens. That night, while the whole city is festive, Naoto is happy with their accomplishment. Kenji reflects that it has been a long journey for the two of them, and he's glad that neither of them died. Grateful, he states that if it wasn't for the blonde, he would probably died, but Naoto disputes him, saying with his strength, he's sure that Kenji will be able to live no matter what. With a smile, Kenji reflects that even though Naoto calls him an idiot, every time he praises his friend, the blonde always acts humble, and it's thanks to Naoto that he was able to fight straightforwardly. Naoto turns to Yuno, saying he still can't believe that she charged at the demon lord despite how far apart their levels were, 
to which Kenji agrees, saying what she did was seriously heroic of her. The demi-human flushes happily, stating it was her who got saved, and it was thanks to all of them that everybody is able to smile. Kenji tells Aria that he's grateful to her as well, as it is thanks to her that they were able to defeat the demon lord. But she looks conflicted, the brunette assures her that it's fine, what she did has nothing to do with her being a demon. Kenji states that he realized it when he looked at the residents of the demon castle, that even for demons there are bound to be good and bad people. As the demon lord has been defeated, Kenji believes the demons will be able to start moving forward and changing, and he confesses that he wants to watch over that movement. Everyone is stunned, especially Naoto, who asks his friend if he really plans to handle the affairs of the demon army. Kenji tells him he wants to be able to do what he can to protect the good demons, which makes the blonde upset. Kenji muses that Naoto did everything he could to get him back to their former world, but what he really wants to do is look after that world with Aria. When she thanks him with a smile, Kenji wholeheartedly believes she's given him her answer. Suddenly, Kenji is whisked away by the citizens who want to award him, and he spends some time with them drinking and celebrating. When he finally escapes, he tries to look for his friends, but they've already left their table. As that world is a game, Naoto muses that even the demon lord is nothing more than a character created by the so-called god. In reality, they have all their lives to live, but it has nothing to do with his world, and that's why if anybody is trying to keep Kenji within that world, there is no doubt then that they are an underling of that so-called god. Currently, Naoto has Yuno on her hands and knees while he coats her behind with a special kind of slime that will make the whole experience for her even better. He steers her to a height of pleasure, and the demi-human can't help but be overwhelmed as she's feeling different than usual. As he continues to tease Yuno, meanwhile, Kenji heads toward the Adventurer's Guild, where he's greeted by the guild leader warmly. She questions the brunette about what he's doing there, when he should be celebrating after having defeated the demon lord, and he answers he's just looking for Frida. However, the guild leader informs him that she's taking a break, which Naoto comments is quite rare for her. The woman guesses that Frida is probably sharing a toast with somebody else caught up in the festival that's happening downtown, but in reality, unknown to both of them. Frida is servicing Naoto while wearing a maid uniform. When the guild leader offers to help Kenji instead of Frida, the adventurer becomes flustered, face red, before asking if there are any good shops around there, as he wants to buy a present for a lady. Meanwhile, Frida continues to use her mouth before using her chest to make Naoto feel good. Eventually, she begs him to take her, to which he willingly complies, driving her to the edge. In another part of the town, Kenji begins perusing items to give to a certain lady. When the other two women are finally spent, Naoto turns his attention to Aria, musing at how she's been glancing at them while he did Yuno and Frida. He realizes she gets off at the immorality of what she's doing, before she mounts off that a priestess shouldn't do something so indecent. The blonde man tells Aria she's next, and without protest, she offers herself to him. Naoto uses his fingers, but when that isn't enough for her, he joins their bodies, and he notes how Aria no longer hides her pleasure. He asks her what it feels like being driven to pleasure by the man she despises, stating he knows that she wanted to do it with Kenji. Naoto starts feeling possessive, thinking everything about Aria is addictive, and he's sure that if Kenji gets a taste of her flesh, he will never return to their former world, so it's why he'll take her for himself. As he gets lost in the pleasure she's given him, Naoto tells her not to be pleasured by the man she hates, but the demon tells him she doesn't hate him. He calls her a liar, reminding her that it's Kenji who she loves, to which Aria agrees before revealing that she loves Naoto as well. During the journey, she's seen how he truly cares for Kenji, but her revelation makes the blonde man angry. Naoto tells her the number one thing he hates the most is lying women who deceive men. Cruelly, he degrades her, calling her scum like he is, and he declares that Kenji is different. If anybody were to take advantage of him, Naoto will never forgive them, and he just wants his friend to return to their world where he'll be able to live a happy and peaceful life. Curiously, Aria reaches for Naoto's face, asking if he really does hate it if Kenji gets used by other people, to which he answers yes. The priestess says she understands how he feels as Kenji is pure, and that's why she loves him, but she points out that that is always his excuse when it comes to Kenji. When Aria asks how he can be so sure that it's not him who's taking advantage of Kenji instead, the blonde's whole world freezes. His mind races as he tries to think if what the demon is saying is true when he only wants to bring Kenji back home. And that's how the first part of this manhwa ends. Well guys, if you like this video and you want a second part, comment below with the word part 2. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, and like the video. But most important, leave a comment. Until the next video.